If you don't go to the games, maybe you'll listen to them. They're on 1190-K-O-R-G on your AM dial. And if you do listen to the broadcasts after this story, you may have a greater appreciation. And there's still a chance to get another power play goal in this double minor. It's great to see Bobby McKillop scoring instead of in the penalty box. We've kind of seen both sides of the killer tonight. 21-year-old Matt Cox is a part-time color analyst for the Anaheim Bullfrogs radio broadcast. He's also blind. I've never thought that because I can't see, I've never been able to do this. One thing I've always told myself is, if you can't succeed, you can always try and just say that you've tried it. If, if you don't do something without trying, then you're just going to have yourself to blame. But if you try it, and then you still can't do it, and even then, you can still find a way into it. There's nothing in this world anybody cannot do. While most broadcasters use a traditional handwritten roster, Matt uses one with quite a different feel. He brings extensive notes, does his homework, and is an encyclopedia of hockey knowledge. He listens carefully to the play-by-play -play of lead man Lou Stowers, picks his spots, and makes his point. I think that benefits the Bullfrogs because they do let everybody get a chance to get to the net. It does make me a better broadcaster because it's kind of humbling to realize that you're somebody's eyes. And that makes you realize that there is more detail out there besides the stick in the pocket. And the one advantage that you do have, because you can't see, you can't see the action away from the play. You can't see fans. You know, sometimes you think that, you know, fans might get in the way of waving signs, and it's perfectly fine for fans to wave signs. But because you can't see and you're relying on the play-by-play -play guy to paint your picture, you can also hear, you can hear the bone grinding of a check. You can hear the beauty of a pass. Cox's craving for commentary is no passing fancy. He's a communications major at Bethany College in Kansas, and his vocational path has always been clear. Always. I mean, ever since I was a little kid. I think the very first voice I mimicked as a little kid was Chick Hearn. And I mean, I used to just stand in the shower and do Laker impressions. And then I moved up to Vince Scully. And I, I would always watch the evening news. I just kind of like, you know, I could do something in this field. And I've always been a great sports fan. And so I've always felt that sports is really my strong point. If I have to do the blood gut war stories, I would. But sports is really my strong point, and that's where I hope to end up. Six to four, Bullfrogs over the Rhino. And just like that, Lou, two quick goals. All right, Matt Cox, what a great kid. By the way, he called Bethany College, where he's going to be a senior. He said, I'm doing all this great work. I'm a communications major. Give me some credit. He's now getting some credit for doing this great work. Wants to do play-by-play. Uh, Matt's paper takes a very different tack. Um, do you have a... Here we go. There's a desk right behind you. Um, and do you have an official title for this? My official title was <laughs> Heroes of the Radio, you know, a history of Heroes of the Radio, which is really what this turned into after, and it was fascinating for me because when we had talked about senior projects two years ago, I had no clue what I was going to do. I thought, you know, possibly that would be my time to go overseas, do something. I didn't know, <laughs> you know. And then last year, last spring, John, it brings up to me the possibility of radio drama. He said, you already know a lot about it. See if you can brainstorm a bit over the summer while you're home and do something that has to do with radio drama. And so while I was home last summer in California, between Bullfrog games, I found myself listening to a lot of episodes of Same Time, Same Station and the KNX Drama Hour and going, this could turn into something. Until finally last fall, we sat down and came up with the thesis statement that Radio drama has influenced pop culture, and that then was narrowed down to heroes in radio drama and the <coughs> of pop culture. Now, I know what y'all are thinking. Most of you that are in my generation are thinking, how? And what type of an environment are we talking about? And I really think to, to get a grip on the environment that we're dealing with, we've got to make our minds go back 50 years ago. Uh, how many of you have seen The Christmas Story? If you haven't, it's a great movie. Go out and rent it right now. <laughs> uh, but to give you an example, there's a, there's a scene in the Christmas story. It's you know about growing up in 1940s Indiana where the kid gets a, a package from Battle Creek, Michigan. And he goes back behind the house to open this package, and there it is, his Orphan Annie decoder pin. And Orphan <laughs> Annie is this kid's radio hero. This kid goes in, he's listening to the radio, he's listening. All of a sudden, there's this secret message from Annie's secret circle. He's writing the message down. Where does he go to decode the message into the one bathroom the house has? He's hiding in the bathroom. All of a sudden, you're hearing, Ralphie, Ralphie, Randy's got to go to the bathroom. And Ralphie's <laughs> writing the message down. And what does the message turn out to be? Does anybody remember? Anybody? Drink more Ovaltine. 
You got it. <laughs> and but it just shows these people really, really believed in what they were listening to. You're looking at a depression-hungry audience that was finding things like the Lone Ranger, which is what my paper concentrated on specifically, and going, this is a great escape to the American West. You know, we're able to tune this in, listen to it, and find out if, you know, and, and really use our minds to escape, and that's what people did. Uh, people would lay down when the radio was on and draw and do things as, as the radio was going on, and I, I really found that fascinating. Um, when you think about it, the Lone Ranger, in a sense, is a tragic hero. We all know who the Lone Ranger is from, as I wrote in my paper, a CBS flop known as the Tarzan Lone Ranger Adventure Hour with Zorro, and I think we all watched that at least one Saturday morning or two. And <laughs> unfortunately, what happened was that when television came along, and I'm sorry, Monette and Mom, TV <laughs> destroyed <laughs> the Lone Ranger as a hero. Um, the Lone Ranger is a story really begins with a guy named Fran Stryker. Fran Stryker was a young producer from Buffalo that went to WXYZ in Detroit in the winter of 1932 and sat down and over time created this pilot episode that wound up becoming The Lone Ranger, The, the Masked Man. It was based very loosely on a novel by Zane Gray called The Lone Star Ranger, but very loosely in the sense of all it was was the name. I looked at Lone Star Ranger and realized there was nothing I could cite from it. I mean. Um, the guy didn't wear a mask, and you know the guy didn't have an Indian named Tonto at his side that was going everywhere. Um, what Stryker did is he's, how he sold it was not only by great writing, using wonderful sound effects and imagination. He had his characters dressed the part. Brace Beamer, who was probably the most famous Lone Ranger, always wore a mask. In fact, he said several times in later interviews that wearing the mask and watching you know, the other people like Jay Michael come into work you know, really helped to emphasize the character. And he used the Lone Ranger to create other great spin-offs like the Green Hornet and Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. He really, those three shows in 1940 were the top three children's shows that were listened to and really believed. Well, about 1950, television came along. And for a while, TV and radio rangers were really competing. Uh, Stryker hadn't yet made a full agreement to sell, and so they were showing some of the old Clayton Moore movies on TV. And you can really tell Brace Beamer's heroism in the final episode of The Lone Ranger, which was in 53, it was the death of Butch Cavendish, the final radio episode. And in, in this episode, Butch Cavendish was the outlaw that uh, wound up killing, supposedly killing six Texas Rangers. Well, as we all know, one Texas Ranger survived, Lone Ranger. And um, <laughs> there you go. Well. Cavendish, in this, ep in this episode, comes back, and Dan Reed, who is the Lone Ranger's nephew, and Dan and the Lone uh, they're going to see Dan Reed's father's grave, and the Lone Ranger's telling Dan all this history, and they replay some of the old episode, and all of a sudden, Cavendish comes in. Tonto knows that Cavendish is there, but Tonto can't get to the Lone Ranger with a telegram in time. Lone Ranger ends up meeting Cavendish. Tonto gets in to see the last part of the fight. Lone Ranger kills Cavendish. And what does the Lone Ranger do? He removes his mask after 3,128 episodes. <laughs> and in, he, you know, he says, look at me, Cavendish. And after Cavendish realizes what happens, the Lone Ranger makes a speech. And in this speech, he says to Dan, who wants to ride with the Lone Ranger, I mean, Dan says, can I ride with you? And the Lone Ranger says, no. I want you to go to college. I want you to go back east to study oration, medicine, and law. And I really think in that speech, that the Lone Ranger made, when he talks about the government and how the West will soon change. Tonto and I, if you promise to go to college, then I will feel that my promise that I made to your father has been fulfilled. And Tonto and I will be able to ride and still be able to find the outlaws and keep the West and turn the West into what it would become. And if you think about it, think about the kids who are listening to that for a second. These are kids like my mom, kids like Monette, you know. These kids would later be plunged under the knife of McCarthyism, and as I said this right in my paper, and 17 years later, some of those kids would wind up going to Woodstock. Why? Because they saw that TV hero. You want to compare? Look at Clayton Moore. Clayton Moore didn't talk. Clayton Moore relied too much on the mask, and to me, the mask destroyed the hero. Because what did you do when you sat down to watch a Lone Ranger episode? You saw that mask. And I'm sure, right in that first few minutes of the half hour, you knew it was going to be as heroes in TV are today. A quick plot, 
something bad was going to happen, and what was going to happen at the end of the half hour or hour, everything would be back to normal, and you'd see the Lone Ranger and Tonto running away into the sunset. And that's really kind of how TV has turned. Uh, TV, in that sense, is defaced the hero. I mean, look at what we have on TV today. We've got The Adventures of Hercules. I mean, how many of us actually sit down and watch that? Well, I did. It was a paper. <laughs> um, but this was truly a paper for me that in, you know, in the long run, I mean, I, Jen and I had some interesting almost arguments this semester because here she'd be working on her book and I'd be like, well, I'm sorry for you, I'm going back to my room, it wasn't another old radio episode. <laughs> you know? I really had fun doing this and I'm hoping that for me, this will lead into some more research as to what happened and especially some more research into radio. Um, there were a couple of issues that I talked about in the paper um, one is, you know, on comparison as to what the adults listen to in comparison to what the kids listen to. And I mean, there were some shows that I just skimmed briefly that I would love to go into more research on. But that's basically what happened. The hero that you're watching today, though it started in old radio, has roughly been destroyed. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but that's really what happened. And I know now when we sit down and watch 90210, you know. Uh, Think though that friends, yes. Um, think though that things like that, and, and I think too today especially, if you look at the westerns that you know, Mom and Andy last Sunday night were watching, was it Dead Man's Walking? And you know, today especially, if we want to sit down and watch a western, we need historical facts. We need something to back the story up. The Lone Ranger didn't have historical facts. I mean, you never had the Lone Ranger and Tonto writing in 1873. They didn't need that. You know, they could rely on, it was the old west, and here was the Lone Ranger off to save somebody else. And so basically, unfortunately, because of our love of history, and because of our reliance on what we see on TV, the hero has been destroyed, and that was my